Coachella, a music festival or a fashion show? The word Coachella always elicits a response from people, but whether it's positive or negative is the big question. Taking place smack dab in the middle of the Californian desert, this once struggling multi-day festival is now referred to as one of the best music events in the entire world. With its impressive roster of performers, combined with its undeniably gorgeous location, Coachella sees hundreds of thousands of attendees annually. But has it become too popular? Now in its 25th year, Coachella has evolved from an indie music and arts festival into a spectacle where social media, sponsored posts, and fashion take center stage. Derisively dubbed the Influencer Olympics, Coachella has received criticism for seemingly prioritizing the more materialistic aspects of the event instead of the music, a sentiment mirrored by its high prices, which have soared to over half a grand from $50. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at everyone's favorite or least favorite music festival, Coachella. We'll be discussing the event's humble origins, its acceptance in the mainstream, the eclectic mix of performers that have graced its stages, the controversies that have arisen in recent years, and the undeniable impact of fashion and influencers on its reputation. Let's get into it. Coachella's origins can be traced back to November 1993, when American rock band Pearl Jam decided to host a revenge concert at the Empire Polo Club in Indio, California. At the time, the band was in dispute with Ticketmaster over prices, oh how little things have changed, and as a result were boycotting venues that were part of the company's network. This tiff had begun earlier that year, when the band had stated that they would be capping the price of tickets for their upcoming Versus tour at $18 with a 10% service charge. While this was great news for their fans, Ticketmaster wasn't too pleased with the arrangement, as their usual $6 to $10 service fees had been slashed to $1.80. At the time, more than half of the concert venues in the US had exclusivity contracts with Ticketmaster, and the year prior, the company had earned over $250 million from its service fees alone. Pearl Jam, who were making a conscious effort to stay true to their grunge roots and not become sellouts, were vocal about their distaste of Ticketmaster's business strategy, publicly accusing the company of price gouging and of having an unfair monopoly on ticket distribution. Keep in mind that back in 1991, Ticketmaster had bought out their only viable competitor, Ticketron, a deal the US Justice Department had signed off on, despite the obvious breach of antitrust laws. Pearl Jam and Ticketmaster were unable to reach a compromise, but as the hottest rock band of the early 90s, they continued with the Versus tour as planned, but only with venues that would abide by the affordable pricing structure they had laid out. This actually proved more difficult than expected, with the band later alleging that Ticketmaster had reached out to promoters to organize their own ban of the tour. Because of this, Pearl Jam had to look at some unconventional venue options, leading them to the Empire Polo Club. Owned by Alexander Hagen III, the giant grass field was usually used for polo tournaments, but it was loaned out for Pearl Jam's show as part of an arrangement with Golden Voice, an LA-based promoter company. Although Indio was in the middle of nowhere, within three days the concert sold out and 25,000 fans were slated to attend, a third of which were local to the area. In the time leading up to the November concert, questions arose about the venue's ability to host a rock concert, which Hagen brushed off. Quote, our grounds are basically grass. We really don't have any concerns about damage. It can be excellent to the valley. It can bring income in. The promoters worked alongside the city's law enforcement for over a month in preparation for the event, but that didn't bring much comfort to some of the city's residents, with one 44-year-old man saying, quote, Why invite trouble? I think that there's going to be shootings, stabbings, theft, and fights. Meanwhile, a 73-year-old woman said, quote, I don't know what kind of clientele it's bringing. I just don't want a bunch of potheads down here. The actual concert was pretty tame, with only a few dozen people suffering mild injuries from the mosh pit, but otherwise, Indio residents expressed that the visitors were well-behaved and that they wanted to see more performers come to town. With the sold-out event being deemed a success, both Hagen and Golden Voice expressed interest in hosting more concerts at the Empire Polo Club, and with that, the seeds for Coachella were officially sown, although nothing would come to fruition for several years. In 1997, Golden Voice owner Paul Tollette was toying around with the idea of a music festival, which brought him back to the Empire Polo Club for the first time since Pearl Jam's concert. After years of negotiations with Hagen and the City of Indio, the Coachella Valley Music and Arts Festival was finally announced on July 28, 1998. 
Unfortunately, this announcement came only one week after the conclusion of Woodstock 99, a multi-day festival that descended into mayhem, resulting in cases of looting, arson, and sexual assault. Coachella organizers quickly distanced themselves from Woodstock 99, saying that it would be a high comfort experience, more similar to Glastonbury Festival. With 80 diverse musical acts that included electronic, alternative rock, and hip-hop, Coachella made an effort to appear more cutting-edge than its competitors, declining big-name bands so they could highlight artistry instead of the year's biggest hits, with Tallette saying, quote, With Coachella, there's a feel we're looking for. More good vibe music. We're not really looking for the slam dance type of crowd. Tickets went on sale that August and were priced at $50 a day, with about 17,000 being sold for the first and 20,000 for the second, leaving the festival a good deal short of its attendance goal of 70,000. Taking place in October 1999, Coachella's biggest challenge wound up being the heat, with temperatures that weekend reaching nearly 120 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the desert for ya. But overall, the event was received positively, with headlining performances by Beck, Rage Against the Machine, and Tool being cited as highlights. Despite losing $850,000 on the venture, Golden Voice decided to bring back Coachella again, but in an attempt to beat the heat, they changed the dates, rescheduling the next installment of the festival from October 2000 to April 2001. Whether it was because of the time of year, or because some of the performers from 1999 were still waiting to be paid, Golden Voice had difficulties getting musical acts to sign on board for 2001's Coachella, and at the end of the day, they were only able to manage 47, resulting in the festival being shortened to a single day event. For a good amount of time, they weren't even sure who the headliners were going to be, but newly reunited rock band Jane's Addiction came to the rescue. Ticket prices were raised to $65, and only 32,000 people attended, resulting in Golden Voice once again operating at a loss, although a significantly smaller one than in 1999. Like its predecessor, the 2001 festival went smoothly, and plans were quickly put in place for the third installment of Coachella the following spring. More acts expressed interest in joining in on the fun, allowing them to revert back to their two-day format. In 2002, Bjork and Oasis were the main headliners, while The Strokes, Bell and Sebastian, Foo Fighters, and Susie and the Banshees were some of the supporting acts, a lineup which solidified the more eclectic direction of the festival. With 55,000 attendees, this was the highest turnout Coachella had seen thus far, and while it still wasn't a smash hit financially, it was with the public, with Rolling Stone magazine even calling it the new standard for all modern rock festivals. The event continued going strong in 2003, with over 80 acts that included the Red Hot Chili Peppers and the Beastie Boys. The festival drew 60,000 attendees, an impressive amount considering the daily price increase to $75, before Ticketmaster service charges, of course. Yes, the irony is palpable. On-site camping was also approved for the first time, with each of the 2,000 plus spots costing $100 for the entire weekend. Honestly, split between four people over two days, that's not bad, even in 2003. After a few shaky years, the festival finally sold out in 2004, seeing 60,000 attendees daily. Tollett credited the success to headliner Radiohead, who he felt had legitimized the event in the eyes of the public and within the music industry. It was also around this time that we began to see celebrities attending Coachella, with Gwyneth Paltrow, Cameron Diaz, Drew Barrymore, and Justin Timberlake tuning in to watch Coldplay's 2005 performance. With Coachella's overall popularity and reputation steadily rising, they began to book more mainstream artists, culminating in their prices rising to $85 in 2006, which coincided with Depeche Mode and Tool as headliners, and Madonna and Daft Punk as supporting acts. In 2007, Coachella was permanently extended to the three-day weekend it has today, something inspired by the organizers missing out on David Bowie as a headliner the prior year. With an extra day added, the festival saw a new personal best with 186,000 attendees over the course of the weekend, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Rage Against the Machine, and Bjork all made their second headlining appearances. In 2008, Coachella failed to sell out for the first time since 2004, and even lost money in spite of its powerhouse headliner, Prince. Considering this was right around the time of the Great Recession, I'm thinking people decided that paying their bills was more important than going to a music festival, especially with daily ticket prices being raised to $90. The following year saw similar levels of attendance, but with The Killers, The Cure, and Paul McCartney being cheaper than Prince, Coachella still broke even. 
In 2010, the festival made one of its biggest changes to date, announcing that they would no longer be offering single-day tickets and instituting weekend passes instead. This garnered a good deal of criticism from festival goers, as they not only had to pay three times more up front, but would also need to pay more for accommodation in order to attend every single day they'd been charged for. Although Coachella had featured hip-hop artists and rappers as supporting acts in the past, 2010 marked the first year that they fully leaned into the genre, with Jay-Z headlining. Although other music festivals were seeing a dip in attendance, Coachella was thriving, with nearly 230,000 people attending the weekend, a new record. However, with more people came more chaos, and thousands of gate crashers wound up breaking through fences to join the festivities, causing them to exceed capacity, and festival security would later say they were experiencing a quote, borderline riot situation. For 2011's festival, Golden Voice made sure to address these security concerns by adding more acreage to the event. This was also a necessity because they had seriously increased the number of musical acts, having close to 200 for the entire weekend. They continued to appeal to the mainstream with headlining performances by Kings of Leon, Arcade Fire, and Kanye West, and saw roughly 75,000 attendees daily. Coachella introduced a second weekend of festivities in 2012, with Paul Tollette citing the overwhelming attendance of the last few years as the reason behind the decision as he didn't want to overcrowd the venue. Many people said that this was a crazy move, especially considering the two weekends had identical lineups, but tickets wound up selling out in less than three hours, even though they were priced at $285 a weekend. Notice how the more popular Coachella gets, the more expensive it becomes? Talk about supply and demand. With an average of 80,000 attendees daily, the festival grossed over $47 million, and it seemed that this new two-weekend formula was a hit. By this point, Coachella had become a pop culture phenomenon, with people either loving it, hating it, or loving to hate it. Because of the increased attendance and introduction of mainstream musical acts, it became more common to hear talk of the event becoming too commercialized, with harsher critics calling Coachella a festival for posers. One industry analyst even said in 2010, quote, Coachella has been established as a tribal right amongst hipsters who go just so they can say they've been. Now there's no denying that the clientele for Coachella had changed significantly since 1999, but that's because the festival's organizers had leaned into the party vibes that had naturally developed at a weekend long sleepover made up of young adults. While there was nothing wrong with hanging out with your friends in a field of grass, the addition of VIP lounges, invite-only pool parties, trendy food vendors, and dance tents made the event more appealing to high-profile individuals. While we'd seen a handful of famous attendees in the past, by the end of the 2000s it had become a rite of passage, with actors, models, and musicians descending on Coachella like a pack of vultures. With all of these A-listers in one place, paparazzi began to frequent the event, and with them came candid photos. These images made Coachella seem like even more of a fantasy, a place where you could hang out with the rich and famous. And knowing that they'd be photographed, celebrities began to dress with purpose, which led to the rise of festival fashion in the mainstream. While there wasn't a set aesthetic for Coachella at the time of its 1999 debut, many attendees were dressed in what could be described as an indie punk rock style, a reflection of the festival's lineup and trends of the time period. In the early 2000s, the festival outfits were casual and comfortable, which in that weather meant the less clothes, the better, at least until the sun went down. Boho chic was a big trend in the mid-2000s, being popularized by the likes of Sienna Miller and the Olsen twins, and the style eventually made its way to Coachella, setting a precedent for festival fashion today. Glastonbury Festival, which Coachella was modeled after, had its own unique look, one that Kate Moss was often credited for pioneering, with the festival being notoriously rainy and muddy, it's in the UK after all, attendees would dress in a utilitarian meets rock star style, with wellies, army jackets, and denim. Coachella, on the other hand, was influenced by its own climate and culture, hence the bikinis, short shorts, fringe, sandals, and flowy dresses, which harkened back to the American hippies of the 1970s. But ironically, with the very consumerism and materialism that the movement was revolting against. By the end of the 2000s, the hipsters had come to Coachella Valley, and brought with them ironic slogan tees, union jacks, flower crowns, fascinators, converse, fedoras, colorful tights, bandanas, skinny jeans, and retro playsuits. 
Following the popularization of Tumblr and Instagram, the social media era was officially upon us, and people began curating their festival looks to be more fashion-forward for the sake of their feed, with some influencers planning their entire year around it. Because of this, Coachella became a bucket list type of event, one where you got to hear your favorite bands, potentially meet your favorite celebrities, wear your most eye-catching outfits, and most importantly, make all of your friends jealous. While the soft grunge tumbler look, consisting of flannels, band tees, combat boots, dark colors, crop tops, and knee-high socks made appearances in festival fashion of the early 2010s, the faux hippie style introduced in the 2000s was still going strong. This style was often worn by celebrities, resulting in those outfits being the ones that most frequently went viral on social media. Because they performed well, it became common to see them recreated by non-festival goers, resulting in a trickle-down effect in mainstream fashion. With Coachella being one of the most talked about events of the year, fast fashion retailers like Topshop, H&M, and Forever 21 began releasing festival collections to cash in on the craze. Common motifs included floppy hats, lace dresses, gladiator sandals, dip-dyed hair, fringe details, crochet, and just a dash of cultural appropriation. It became increasingly common to see people wear Native American headdresses, jewelry, and prints, as well as Indian piercings and bindi at Coachella, treating these important symbols as a costume, which started a heated debate about appropriation versus appreciation. While it had become commonplace to see celebrities at Coachella in the 2010s, there were a few who became Coachella regulars, like Kate Bosworth, Vanessa Hudgens, Emma Roberts, Katy Perry, Paris Hilton, Kendall and Kylie Jenner, Gigi Hadid, Zoe Kravitz, and Alessandra Brosio. For some of these stars, their trips to Coachella received more attention than anything else they did over the course of the year, so you can understand why they took the opportunity to dress up. It was like the Met Gala, but casual. Over the course of the 2010s, Coachella's prices steadily increased, and by 2018, general admission passes cost $429, although I'm not gonna lie, with Beyonce as a headliner that year, they could have charged even more and still sold out. I can't handle crowds, but if I had a time machine, I'd go back and buy tickets. Beyonce was originally slated to perform at 2017's Coachella, but had to withdraw as she was pregnant with her twins, inspiring her to come back with a bang in 2018. And boy, did she succeed. The first black woman to headline the festival, Beyonce paid tribute to black culture with appearances by Destiny's Child, gospel music, a full marching band with majorette dancers, and a step show. The performance, which was referred to as Baychella, was the highlight of the festival, immediately receiving critical acclaim and becoming one of the most live-streamed events in history. Baychella would later serve as the focus for the 2019 Netflix documentary Homecoming, which highlighted all of the work that went into the now-iconic performance. While Coachella as a whole had been a cultural talking point for over a decade, this was the first time that a single performance had gone viral to this extent, and Beyonce essentially set a precedent for all future headliners. This was an incredibly tough act to follow, and the subsequent year's headliners, Ariana Grande, Childish Gambino, and Tame Impala, received some criticism for their less grandiose shows. Any event that gets over 80,000 people a day is expected to have its fair share of drama, whether it's because of the event itself or the people attending. Over the years, concerns about prices had become more and more common, but at the end of the day, Coachella had no problem selling tickets. These increased prices were reflected in all aspects of the festival, including food and drink, which came in at about $20 on average. Now, Coachella did have free water and shade stations, but at 100 degree weather, it wasn't uncommon for people to experience heat stroke, and nobody was exempt from this, not even people working the festival, with the Daily Beast publishing a report in 2019 that alleged that employees received insufficient food and water while standing for long hours in the harsh sun. While this should have caused an uproar, the public's attention was on a different piece of drama that had emerged from the festival, the feud between 20-year-old James Charles and 38-year-old Toddy Westbrook. The popular beauty YouTubers were known to be close, having collaborated multiple times in the past, but on May 10th, 2019, Westbrook posted a video titled By Sister that said she would no longer be associating with Charles for a variety of reasons, including his allegedly predatory behavior. The video and her claims quickly went viral, resulting in Charles losing 3 million subscribers while Westbrook gained 4 million. The catalyst for the entire fiasco was that year's Coachella, 
which Charles had attended. At the festival, Charles had said that the crowd was making him feel unsafe, and so he made a quick arrangement with vitamin company Sugar Bear Hair. In exchange for a sponsored post, they would provide security. Simple, right? Well, because Westbrook had her own supplement brand, Halo Beauty, she saw Charles' endorsement of her direct competitor as a betrayal, and thus, Bi Sister was born. Sugar Bear Hair was just one of many companies that began partnering with influencers at Coachella during the social media era. Some sent out clothes, others invitations to exclusive events, and others gave out free tickets. Since 2015, fast fashion company Revolve has held Revolve Festival, their own mini music festival with drinks, performances, and plenty of photo opportunities for people to flood their followers' feeds with. With such a large chunk of attendees being influencers, people who are more focused on creating content than the event itself, some critics began to say that Coachella was ruined. I personally don't see the issue, because if you actually are there for the music, what does it matter if a random person you don't know is taking photos of their outfit? Pay attention to the stage instead. Sure, every April it does get a bit exhausting to endlessly scroll through dozens of Coachella OOTDs, but it's also important to understand that it is their job. Can you really fault them for participating in something that guarantees more exposure and engagement? The thing that I do find issue with, which isn't really unique to Coachella, is the blatant wastefulness on display. How many copies of the same outfit do companies send out knowing full well it's just going to get returned? How many people buy an entire festival wardrobe that they never wear again? How many water bottles and beer cans are thrown on the ground and forgotten immediately? After a two-year hiatus in 2020 and 2021 because of the pandemic, a cancellation that Coachella queen Vanessa Hudgens was livid about, the festival finally returned in 2022 with headliners Harry Styles, Billie Eilish, and Swedish House Mafia. Originally, Kanye West was supposed to perform, but he withdrew two weeks before it took place. In 2023, Bad Bunny, Blackpink, and Frank Ocean were the headliners. Bad Bunny marked the festival's first Latin headliner, while Blackpink was the first of Asian descent. This lineup really highlighted how much the music festival space had changed over the course of the 21st century, no longer being dominated by white male rock stars. And sure, you could say that it wasn't the same festival anymore, but I'd argue that there's nothing more cutting edge than diversity. So aren't they still doing what they always set out to do? There's nothing about Coachella that appeals to me personally. It's too hot, it's too crowded, it's too expensive. But I can understand why people keep showing up. Whether it's for the music or the memories, there's something about it that's kind of magical. And even though the prices keep getting higher, clocking in at $5.99 for general admission in 2024, considering all of the musicians you're paying to see in one place, is that really a bad deal? Has Coachella become commercialized? Of course, but that's the fault of the organizers more than it is the people attending, which is actually pretty funny considering the idea to have a concert in the desert in the first place was in protest of companies overcharging fans to see their favorite musicians. What do you think about Coachella? I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon!